Watson only mode. Hello and uh, welcome to uh, the TVN webinar series. Um, this is John Muscleri speaking. I'm the scientific uh, director for uh, for TVN, and thank you for taking the time um, out of your uh, busy schedules uh, to join uh, today. We have a fairly large uh, uh, group of people uh, that have registered for this webinar, over 230 people, so uh, welcome uh, to all. Today's webinar will be on post-discharge rehabilitation interventions for old, older adults with cognitive impairment following okay, a hip fracture. Um, I, I apologize for that. One of the hazards of working in the hospital. Um, so today's uh, webinar series, it's, it's a regular forum. We, these are monthly webinars where we, um, we, we have Canadian and international experts share research and insights on advancement in assessing and caring for frail elderly Canadians or Canadians who are in, in late uh, life uh, phases. And uh, we have been highlighting outcomes of, of TVN-funded knowledge synthesis grants, and, and today's uh, presentation is no exception. Our two presenters uh, today are Catherine uh, McGill, uh, McGilton, uh, who's a senior scientist with the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, University Health Network. She's an associate professor in the Lawrence uh, Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing and holds an uh, um, Ontario Ministry of Health uh, career, uh, mid-career scientist award. Uh, she's been funded uh, as a PI by a variety of funding uh, institutions and uh, her research focus is on care of the persons with cognitive impairment. Um, and specifically identifying interventions and models of care leading to effective patient outcomes. Our other presenter is Paula Van uh, Wyk, uh, who is an assistant professor in Faculty of Human Kinetics, University of Windsor, which is my where I used to be from. Uh, she's a completed postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Dr. McGilton, and uh, she's uh, received a doctorate in ergonomics and aging at Western uh, University and their research focuses on improving quality of care, quality of life, and enabling physical abilities of individuals with cognitive impairment. Um, our, um, uh, everybody is on uh, mute mode uh, the, during the webinar to minimize noise, so please submit any questions that you may have online during the webinar uh, using uh, the chat function and uh, we'll organize all the questions and uh, group the ones that are similar and get to as many of them as possible at the end uh, of um, uh, of the webinar. So without further ado, I'll turn it over uh, to Catherine and Paula to take us through uh, their, their presentation. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, so I'm Catherine McJilton. I'll be speaking for the first 10 slides, and then Paula, uh, my previous postdoc student, is actually going to take over. So um, I'm pleased that you could be with us today, and we're going to be talking about post-discharge rehab interventions for older adults with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture. And of course, none of this work is done by just the two of us. We actually uh, wrote the grant, but of course, we had experts with us along the way, and I just want to acknowledge them here. And of course, we have some knowledge users and um, highly qualified uh, professionals with us. And our information scientist was very helpful as well. So the objectives of our presentation today, number one, to highlight the need for the development of interventions and continued research involving community-based settings for older adults with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture, and to review the evidence or lack thereof of interventions aimed to facilitate recovery among older adults with CI following a hip fracture in community settings. And lastly, to discuss the gaps in the literature and potential next steps moving forward. So as you may or may not know, um, this uh, approximately 35,000 hip fractures occur in a year in Canada, and projections indicate that the incidence will increase nearly fourfold by 2041. And so hip fractures remain a public health concern. <clears throat> 
And as a consequence, a hip fracture is often a catastrophic event that results in significant impairment in mobility, independence, and ability to live in the community. And most importantly, it actually makes it very difficult for some of our clients to actually go back to their previous living uh, residence. So long-term care outcomes aren't great for this group. Um, within the first year after experiencing hip fracture, there are high, high rates of institutionalization and mortality. And additionally, the significant morbidity associated with hip fractures are a public health concern. The ability to regain mobility, function, and independence performing activities of daily living are challenged due to a decline in muscle power associated with poor balance, slower gait, and increase of falls. Progress may be further complicated by the presence of cognitive impairment, and I'm basically suggesting that when I define cognitive impairment, it's either somebody with a dementia and or delirium or both. Um, especially since there's, this population has traditionally had no access to sort of acute care rehab despite having a higher incidence of hip fractures. Um, a, although inpatient rehab care can aid an older adult on their journey of recovery, it is often months to a year over after discharge when progress is established, if at all. Um, so anyway, this is a concern. So when you look at the incidence of dementia, and I think also we're seeing a higher rates of delirium, cognitive impairment is definitely a concern for this, our aging population. And given that many more clients have multimorbidity, this is again going to be a major concern in the, in the future. What we have found um, is that cognitive impairment is a common pre-existing condition. Uh, we are wondering why clients are falling. Uh, we are trying to track that as well, and we do find that uh, some of the clients are experiencing their falls in their home. Um, and also, for instance, even things like falling over their cats or dogs at home. So it's, we're struggling a little bit with this notion of prevention. It is important to focus on, but just to, to, to keep that in mind. Um, we're at this point, progress, uh, we have evidence that sometimes when a client does have cognitive impairment, it does impact recovery. And, um, and, and we also wonder, because when we looked at some of these studies, that a lot of these clients actually don't receive rehab, so that also might influence their poor uh, outcomes. We also realize that healthcare services are fragmented. There is actually quite a difficulty in getting gaining access to rehab beds. So obviously the consequences of not being able to receive rehab is that a lot of the clients are not able to regain mobility and function. We do see that more of these clients are admitted to long-term care. This transition and permanent placement into long-term care proves a high burden of cost which is expected to reach approximately 2.4 billion in Canada by about 2041 again. <clears throat> So, negating process progress, How do, what, do we need, what do we know? So, although there is evidence to suggest that um, community-based rehab programs can be beneficial, there has yet to be a synthesis of studies that focus on community-based rehab interventions post-discharge from hospital for older adults with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture. I was very fortunate about eight years ago with, to work with a wonderful bunch of um, scientists, clinicians, healthcare practitioners at Toronto Rehab where we developed a model of care that really tried to um, bring this population, clients with cognitive impairment and hip fractures into an active rehab environment. Luckily we had great success um, and we've published those papers. And what we also did, though, when we wrote this grant is we said, let's also follow them at three and six months to see how they do once they go home. Uh, we are trying to, this published paper will soon be published, and what we have noticed, of course, is a decline in both ADL and mobility. So these clients are not doing as well as we'd hoped, uh, some of them are a bit concerned. So I guess we're worried that if progress made during inpatient rehab is negated by discharging the patient home without any proper resources or continued rehab, then the health of the patient will be impacted. And of course, so will the burden on the caregivers, because uh, as you know, or maybe you don't know, probably at least half the population did have caregivers. The next important step is, we thought was to develop interventions to reduce decline once the older person with cognitive impairment is discharged home. And a recent systematic review on early discharge planning and long-term care outcomes for older adults with and without CI post-hip fracture identi identified a gap in the knowledge of post-discharge rehab requirements that are necessary to, to achieve these recovery outcomes. So thus, uh, the review protocol presented in this paper will concentrate on community-based rehab post hospital discharge interventions focused on older adults with CI following a hip fracture. Um, 
there were uh, some previous reviews um, and actually the effectiveness of community-based rehab programs for older adults with CI is poorly understood. Um, it's imperative for decision makers, clinicians, and researchers to know the evidence supporting the effectiveness of outpatient community-based rehab programs. So therefore, we actually decided to do this review. So the purpose of it was actually to um, conduct a systematic review to evaluate the evidence on the effectiveness of community-based rehab post-hospital discharge interventions for older adults with CI following a hip fracture and to identify the physical recovery outcomes and measures used in previous studies. So at this point, I'm just going to turn it over to Paula, who's actually going to talk about uh, what we found when we actually did our systematic review. Thank you, Kathy and TVN again for allowing us to present our research today. I'll discuss a little bit of the methods of what led us through the systematic review process. More information regarding our protocol, however, has previously been published. If you need more reference than that, I can provide that at a later date and time. So our search terms, quite ob obviously, included a variety of different terminologies of surrounding cognitive impairment as well as hip fracture. We searched a total of 11 different databases to try and ensure that we weren't missing any of the different types of articles that may be out there. Once we had done this through the database, we actually had EndNote that we were using to help organize everything. So all of the results were dumped into that program. As we wanted to ensure that we also included gray literature, our data sources search also included contacting our authors, requesting unpublished work, as well as looking at conference abstracts. Now the researchers of the team are the ones that did the gray literature search. However, our information specialist is the individual who ran the search sites uh, databases for us. The titles and the abstracts, abstracts were first screened by two independent reviewers. If one reviewer was uncertain about whether the article fulfilled the inclusion criteria, it was included for full text review. When we were screening the titles and abstracts, we were pretty much looking for four specific things. Did the study include a rehabilitation intervention? Did it have a community component? Did the patient participants have cognitive impairment? And did they also suffer a hip fracture? I've asked, have put an asterisk beside the community component because we originally said community-based rehabilitation post-discharge was defined to include interventions that were initiated once an individual was discharged home from the inpatient rehab for hip fracture. However, as we went through this process, we had, our definition needed to be revised to actually include interventions that began during inpatient care and transitioned into the community. Although the inpatient care was now a part of the definition, the focus of this review was specific, specifically on the community-based components. For our inclusion criteria, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at interventions that had aims of maintaining or improving function and mobility, or they could have also looked at other outcome measures such as mortality, length of stay, or dwelling location. The individuals included in the, the search which should be 65 years of age and older, but this could have also include, included the mean age. For cognitive impairment, we excluded anyone who had a stroke, Parkinson's, or frontal temporal dementia, as these have different physiological and behavioral markers. Obviously, we also looked at the studies that had hip fracture. We had to limit our search to, to English and French, as that was the only language abilities of the research team. For the data extraction, we had our lovely HQPs independently review the full text articles. We had to, together as a team, via Excel developed a data extraction form which included gaining information such as this, things about the study, participant demographics, interventions, the components or the setting, outcomes, analyses, as well as whether or not it was randomized, the allocations, and the blinding processes. If multiple articles were written about the same study, only the article with the most information that was pertaining to the participants with cognitive impairment was retained. For any articles that were missing information, we would contact all of the corresponding authors and did our best to make sure we could still include them. As with any systematic review, it is always critical to make sure that you have a quality assessment 
the HQPs were also responsible to independently extract the data and use a critical appraisal check, check sheet for this. We chose to use the Downs and Black checklist for a variety of, reason, variety of reasons. This checklist was designed to include both RCTs as well as non-randomized control trials. We know in healthcare that interventions are rarely at this stage in the game RCTs, therefore we wanted to make sure our checklist for quality control included this. We also know that a systematic review that has previously been published within the realm of hip fractures, but not the same settings or patient population, use this checklist for theirs. To discuss some of the results, when we first did our search, it was in September 2013, and we yielded 3,700 articles, which is a lot less than some of the other presentations we've heard of over the last couple of months. So that might have been a blessing for us. From these results, approximately 1,500 were duplicates, which we were able to run through the EndNote software program. And we removed these, leaving just over 200, 2,200 articles, uh, titles, and abstracts that we were to screen. From this, we were able to whittle it down to 52 for full text articles. To ensure that the review included the most current evidence, the search was then updated again using the exact same search strategy in December 2013, February 2014, as well as in April 2015. However, no relevant studies that could be added to the, to the study were retrieved. At the end of all of the process of an analyzing, we ended up with three studies. Although the interventions, as you will hear for these three studies, were not specifically designed for individuals with cognitive impairment, they did include a sub-analysis for this patient population, and thus we decided that they met our inclusion criteria. Findings from only one of the study was actually reported across three different studies, and this was the Shayu et al. 2012 paper. We decided to take that one as the reference, as it had the, re uh, the reports on the subgroup analysis for individuals with cognitive impairment with physical recovery outcomes, and the others were just used for additional information when needed. Unfortunately, we were not able to conduct a meta-analysis due to the heterogeneity of the measures and the outcome. All three studies ended up being random, randomized control trials, and they had different follow-up periods that ranged from 16 weeks post-discharge to two years post-discharge. Primary data collection was used in all of the studies. However, additionally, Mosley et al. 2009 used an administrative database. With respect to their eligibility of inclusion exclusion criteria, they each needed to have somebody that was 60 years of age or older, they had to be admitted to a hospital with a hip fracture. They had to receive hip arthroplasty or internal fixation. And then Mosley et al. had to have surgical fixation for a hip fracture. The participant's pre-fracture physical condition was also an inclusion criteria in each of the studies. With respect to the interventions from each of the studies, they were all initiated while the participants were on the inpatient unit. The participants in all three studies received assessments, rehabilitation, home assessments, counseling during inpatient stay, as well as discharge planning. To tell you a little bit more about the individual interventions, we've broken them down by the study. The SUCO et al. 2000 referred their intervention group to a geriatric inpatient unit immediately after randomization, whereas the control group was discharged to other hospitals. Their rehabilitation program involved seven intervention components, and this was the highest number of components across all three studies. These seven components included inpatient physical rehabilitation, which was provided twice a day, cognitive rehabilitation with a psychiatrist, which was four times a week, discharge assessments that involved home assessments and the need for AIDS, there was family education about hip fractures, and nurse and physiotherapist meetings to discuss methods of improving rehab. After discharge, participants were provided with 10 in-home physiotherapy visits. For the Shayu et al. intervention, they had six components, which began prior to surgery with a geriatric consultant provided by a geriatrician and nurses uh, trained in geriatrics. After surgery, the geriatrician provided suggestions to the care team in order to modify or develop a care plan for rehabilitation. 
The six components from this intervention included inpatient assessment by a rehab physician, nurse, and physical therapist, inpatient physical rehab with two visits from a physical therapist, daily geriatric nurse visits, comprehensive discharge assessment, and the home assessment prior to discharge. Additionally, they included eight in-home visits from a registered nurse in the first three months following discharge. They also had three in-home visits from a physiotherapist. The control group received routine care, which does not include continuity of care, geriatric assessment, an intervention or interdisciplinary approach, or in-home visits. And lastly, the Mosley et al. article provided rehabilitation during inpatient care and continued their exercise regime post-discharge. Their intervention only had two components. The first being physical rehabilitation, which consisted of one-hour sessions twice a day for 16 weeks. And they also had physical therapy in the home over eight visits by a physical therapist after they were discharged from the inpatient rehab unit. Now to take a little bit of a closer look at some of the physical outcomes, specifically from the same article there, the Mosley et al. one. They used a primary outcome measure of knee extensor strength for which there were no statistically significant group differences or between group differences following intervention among those with cognitive impairment. Further analysis revealed a significant interaction between those in the intervention group and those with cognitive impairment compared to those in the control group for physical function outcome measures such as walking speed at both 4 and 16 weeks, the physical performance and mobility exam, the PPME, at both 4 and 16 weeks, body sway at 4 weeks, and at 16 weeks there was improvements in the step test, the maximum balance range test, coordinated stability test, and the modified falls efficacy scale. Pain and quality of life measures were also improved at 16 weeks for the individuals with cognitive impairment that were in the intervention group, and this was significant compared to those in the control group. For the physical outcomes from the Shayu et al. paper, they measured hip flexion ratio and mobility with the walking item on the Chinese Barthel Index. Their results indicated that participants with cognitive impairment in the intervention group were more likely to recover their walking ability compared to the control group. However, no statistically significant differences in hip flexion ratio in patients with CI were found. Another outcome measure that we looked at was activities of daily living, and in the studies included in this systematic review, it was considered to be a secondary outcome. Both Mosley et al. and Shayu et al. used the Barthel ADL scale to assess their activities of daily living, but additionally Mosley et al. used the PPME, which was the Physical Performance and Mobility Exam. Significant improvements were reported for participants with cognitive impairment in the intervention group for both studies, and for Mosley it was also for both of their measures. Other outcome measures that we looked at were dwelling location, length of stay, and mortality. So two studies examined whether the intervention impacted participant dwelling location as well as mortality. Husuko et al. 2000 specifically reported that the length of hospital stay for those in their intervention group who had mild and moderate dementia was significantly shorter than the control group. They also found that significantly more participants with mild and moderate dementia from the intervention group were living at home compared to the control group three months after discharge. And they continued to live independently one year after the operation. However, that was not significantly, statistically significant. Whereas Shayu et al. 2012 reported that those with cognitive impairment in the intervention group were most likely to be readmitted into the hospital in the two years following discharge and that rates of institutionalization were the same between the intervention and the control group. Both studies found no significant differences in mortality between the intervention and control groups. Personally, I find that the discussion of the findings is a lot more entertaining and interesting than some of the effectiveness components. This review demonstrated that there was there still is a current lack of outpatient rehab interventions targeted towards older adults with cognitive impairment following hip fracture. 
Although there has been some increased focus emphasizing the need for older adults with CI following a hip fracture to be included in rehab interventions, they have primarily focused on the inpatient settings. The three studies that met our inclusion criteria presented results of interventions that were not designed to specifically meet the needs of individuals with CI, which is actually similar to other reviews. But they did stratify their samples from the original studies to conduct a subgroup analysis, and hence why they were included as previously mentioned. The results of this review suggest that community-based rehab post-hospital discharge interventions are effective to improve various physical function outcomes, mobility, and activities of daily living functions one year post-discharge from the hospital for older adults with cognitive impairment. Although there is insufficient evidence to indicate the effectiveness of these interventions to enable older adults with CI to live in their homes over the long term, there is evidence to suggest that these programs can increase the likelihood of staying home for a short period of time, for example, three months after discharge from the inpatient rehab programs. These promising results are significant, are significant because cognitive impairment is a negative prognostic factor for older adults with hip fracture immediately after inpatient discharge. However, we do say that there needs to be cautious interpretation as the evidence may appear more positive than it actually is. The paucity of studies that deliver an intervention specifically to the population with cognitive impairment is concerning for a number of reasons. There are approximately 35,000 and rising hip fractures reported annually in Canada alone, and cognitive impairment is present among half of these individuals who experience a hip fracture. Yet the high prevalence of cognitive impairment among this population, just the mere presence of the cognitive impairment has traditionally been a barrier to accessing rehab services. The continued exclusion from inpatient or outpatient rehab of this population is a concern because evidence shows that individuals with CI who are admitted into inpatient rehab can recover from their hip fractures and return home. Thus, they are viable candidates for rehab. Despite existing evidence that shows older adults with cognitive impairment can regain their function when provided access to care, the lack of literature in this area makes it difficult to determine the feasibility, acceptability, and effectiveness of the components within an outpatient rehab intervention for older adults with cognitive impairment. Given the debilitating and omnipresent soliloquy of cognitive impairment, it would be reasonable to expect that those with cognitive impairment generally need more individualized care than what st standard care currently offers. Future research needs to focus on interventions that afford these opportunities for this patient population. Notwithstanding, through conducting this review, we were able to gain a few critical insights regarding the design and implementation of outpatient rehab interventions. There was a consensus between the three studies that the outpatient rehab intervention should begin early in the care trajectory, while the participants are still re receiving their inpatient care, and then should include discharge planning and transition to the community. Early initiation of an intervention and discharge planning optimizes the continuity of care during the transition from an inpatient hospital setting back into the community, which is a crucial aspect of geriatric care because older adults recovering from a hip fracture are at most risk during transitions. During this transition back to the community, an inconsistency of care can negatively impact patients' ability to maintain their progress they made during that inpatient rehab. Their resulting deterioration can then result in a higher likelihood of re-injury, being re-hospitalized, or relocating to a long-term care facility, or possibly death. The other acquired insight in this is that interdisciplinary teams were included in all of the interventions. Physiotherapy was included in all of the interventions, but unfortunately the details of what that physical therapy component actually consisted of was vague or poorly described by the authors. The lack of information regarding the physio physiotherapy component of the interventions is concerning as there has been increased emphasis on the post-operative physio or occupational therapy that should be provided. We have defined this ambiguity, ambiguity, 
I cannot talk at this moment, but as the black box of physiotherapy. Because there is no standard evidence-based care practice for this particular population in the community, it is challenging to determine who is the best person to deliver the therapy, as well as the appropriate dose, frequency, intensity, and outcome measures if we are unable to compare and analyze these components within the intervention. In addition to physical therapy provided by a physiotherapist, other healthcare professionals, professionals delivered additional intervention components such as cognitive therapy, home assessments, family education, and discharge assessments. Although the effectiveness of these components was not individually evaluate, evaluated within each article, it does highlight the importance of implementing an interdisciplinary team. This finding is consistent with other systematic reviews in the literature that suggest multidisciplinary interventions are beneficial when caring for older adults, especially for individuals with cognitive impairment. As it currently remains unclear what an intervention for individuals with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture should involve, the results of this review indicate that there are several gaps that recru require attention to move this field forward. Firstly, only one study described physiotherapists and nurses giving counseling to family members. To manage the needs of older adults transitioning from hospital to home, there is a shift of responsibilities to family and other informal caregivers who thus need added support and resources. Being more inclusive towards family members, caregivers, and community care providers in discharge planning can help decrease the consistency of care after discharge. Future studies should provide emotional and physical support for family caregivers to mitigate the risk of burnout, especially as caregiv caregivers are getting older and may have chronic health issues themselves. Also, further consideration on how to best leverage and encourage the role of family caregivers who are pivotal in translating concepts from the inpatient setting to outpatient home care to increase parents' patients reintegration into the community, social activities, and other in interests outside the home is critical. I know we've already spoke a little bit about how the interventions were not specifically made for individuals with cognitive impairment, but we feel it's important to highlight again. There is a need to focus on interventions that are tailored specifically to the patient as well as to their personal goals. Since it remains unknown if adapting currently existing frameworks or interventions for those with cognitive reserve remains intact, or using a framework previously developed intervention to include older adults with CI is optimal. Perhaps interventions for individuals with CI need to be developed tabula rosa. The needs of older adults with cognitive impairment may not be addressed by pre-existing rehab programs or standardized checklists intended for a wider, potentially healthier population. Conceivably, a rehab program for older adults with CI following a hip fracture may need to consist of specific components focused explicitly on their physical and cognitive advancements. Cognitive rehab focuses on identifying and addressing individual needs and goals of the patient and targets cognitive functioning and introduce compensatory methods such as using memory aids. The goals of cognitive rehab are congruent with providing person-centered care in order to meet the needs of older adults with cognitive impairment. More research should be done incorporating aspects of cognitive rehab with physical rehab in outpatient settings. Additionally, care teams need to involve the patient and their families to ensure that care and services are relevant to help them meet their goals. Pilot testing of evidence-based interventions using this approach is warranted and the first step to establishing a new framework applicable for this population. A third gap that we were able, uh, we wanted to discuss was that we were unable to compare and evaluate which program components were essential to include in an outpatient rehab program due to the heterogeneity of outcome measures, the lack of description regarding the cognitive function assessments and measurements, poor participant descriptions, for example, the type of their cognitive impairment or even baseline data and comorbidities, and the lack of treatment fidelity monitoring that was included in the articles. The lack of interventions designed for individuals with cognitive impairment may be due to a lack of consensus on the proper tools appropriate to measure progress among this population. This highlights the need to increase evidence-based care. <clears throat> 
Future research programs should use the same assessment and measurement tools consistently so we will be able to directly compare studies to identify what components are most effective for those with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture. Greater discussion needs to be had regarding the patient profile that is most suitable for these programs, the corresponding tools that are feasible for the assessment of older adults with cognitive impairment, and incorporating, incorporating relevant gold standards for measuring mobility, function, and ability to perform activities of daily living. Furthermore, more attention needs to be focused on the comparability of performance in a clinical setting versus the patient's home. If the direction of creating more tailored individualized interventions is adopted, appropriate tools based on the patient's goals and needs should be integrated and used as a measure of intervention success. Navigating the goals of the patient, especially if provided by a proxy, as well as family members or informal caregivers, also requires further attention. And lastly, cost or cost effectiveness to the patient care provision was not an outcome in the included studies which happen to be from Taiwan, Finland, and Australia. I make that point because if Canada claims they want to be leading researchers in this area, it's a little concerning that this review found zero studies in all of North America. Furthermore, the cost of providing hospital care is generally the largest healthcare cost driver, cost driver in any healthcare system, which favors the trend towards community-based treatments and programs to mitigate care costs. Given the concerns regarding fiscal sustainability and public health care and the general increase in health care spending, future programs that evaluate the economic value of the intervention and include a cost-effectiveness analysis is warranted. As with any study, we have our strengths and we have our limitations. We truly believe that one of our strengths is the fact that we included a, a librarian specialist within our review. She was able to help us with the search strategy, as well as actually conduct the search once, it was com once the strategy was completed and agreed upon. We also ensured that we used a multiple number of search engines, which is of course something that the librarian specialist not only had access to, but also had experience using, as well as a variety of search terms. We also decided that we were going to search all of the databases from inception rather than try and limit the date in which we were going to be doing our search for. We also considered multiple outcomes, and even with that, we still ended up coming up with heterogeneity of outcomes and their measurements. We do have some limitations. Our findings were constrained by the methodological quality and because of the, the knowledge or language abilities of our research team, we were only able to search for articles in French or in English. Based on the limited amount of evidence, our review suggests that community-based rehab interventions post-hospital discharge from inpatient rehab appear to be effective, to, effective in approving physical function outcomes, mobility, and activities of daily living function one year post-discharge from the hospital for older adults with cognitive impairment. And this shows promising results to increase the likelihood of returning home for a short, for example, three-month period after discharge. There is insufficient evidence to indicate the effect of these programs to keep patients at home over a longer period of time. It currently remains unclear what components an outpatient rehab intervention for individuals with cognitive impairment following a hip fracture should involve. However, our review findings suggest that these interventions should start early in the trajectory of care while the patient is in inpatient rehab and preemptively include discharge planning, dis discharge planning discussions. It should also be designed with the inclusion of physiotherapy to address the physical components of rehab, and it should be executed by an interdisciplinary team to provide multifaceted care that continues into the community setting. Given the prevalence of hip fractures in older adults with cognitive impairment, future research should focus on providing support to the family caregivers, as well as including them into the care, care plan to enhance the reintegration into the community, and pilot testing these programs that include the goals of the patient and the family. A future program of research evaluating these interventions should consider utilizing the same outcome measures, the cognitive function assessments, the detailed participant descriptions such as their comorbidities and the type of cognitive impairment in order to serve as a significant building block towards developing a consistent 
and expected standard of practice in community-based rehab for older adults with cognitive impairment following hip fracture. Thank you once again for tuning in to our webinar. We appreciate all of, all of the questions that are about to come. And at this point, I'll turn it over to, I believe, Carol. Thank you, Kathy and Paula. That was a very informative presentation. And yes, I do have a few questions. Um, so the first one I have, and I'm not sure who wants to answer this one, uh, should a fall and hip fracture in someone who is cognitively impaired be considered a matter of late life and should advanced care planning discussions be emphasized in this population in addition to the rehab? Okay, I'd like to take that one. It's Kathy. <laughs> I think there is not a one-size-fits-all for any, any issue problem. So I think you really have to take into account their pre-level fracture status, their um, on also cognitive status prior. Um, some of, many of the clients we've seen in our studies are actually surviving quite beautifully at 80 years old living at home with a little bit of memory impairment. They are running to catch a bus, they fall, um, some of them, if they don't get into rehab, go into long-term care. So I think this um, notion that perhaps they're at the end of life is something we have to be very, very careful about. Um, again, we are all going to be continuing to live for much longer. Uh, we are getting our new knees, new hips, uh, our, and we have medications to keep us going. Uh, we have to be very careful about making decisions around end of life based on an age, uh, a cognitive impairment, and a hip fracture. Hmm. Okay, here's another question. As you mentioned, one of the interventions involving continued care planning after inpatient rehabilitation. Did any of these studies mention how this is organized? For example, through discharge planner, social work, family doc, etc. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the middle part of that. Um, it, it was basically, did any of the studies mention how the interventions uh, for care planning? I would love to tell you that the answer is yes, but unfortunately, as mentioned with, for example, what did the physiotherapy components con consist of, any parts of the intervention were actually very vaguely described. They might have been mentioned, but what actually happened um, or what was detailed was not provided. But that doesn't um, sort of stop us from perhaps going back, if you're interested, to look to actually ask the author, um, do they have some sort of a continuity of care plan that could they, you know, you could access? Because I think that's a very good point. I think we, we notice that between transitions between acute care even and rehab, there are certain things about the individual person that are very crucial to develop to developing very good care practices. Um, you know what what they like, what they don't like, what uh, kind of can upset them. Um, these are the best sort of exercises that are, are working to re re regain strength. So we want to see that actually between all care transition points. So it would be very helpful to have some sort of care plan where we can go and use this across multiple sites. Hmm. Good. Okay. Kathy, I have another question for you. Uh, why do few people with cognitive impairment not receive rehabilitation? Sure. Uh, well, I went into that a little bit uh, prior to our <clears throat> when, when I was talking. I think the first real issue is there's a, a sort of a belief that this group of clients cannot be rehabbed. Uh, so we, we came across this when we were trying to, you know, work with uh, directors of care, health care practitioners, um, and even some family members. It was like, what? Uh, this is hard to believe. So what we, obviously debunking that myth was really one of the most important things we actually had to do. We um, also really thought, what we look at the system, there aren't enough rehab beds for older persons. Uh, absolutely, this is a problem. I think our Minister of Health has actually dedicated and has said we need more rehab beds for this population. So I think as we get older, we're going to have traumas um, and therefore we need to be, you know, repaired and, and back to our homes. So I think we're going to have to look at that. So then access obviously becomes an issue then if we only have so few beds to go around. Um, and what happens in the system is we see very strict criteria to enter into acute care rehab facilities, which is where I believe many of these clients deserve uh, a place to be rehabbed in. 
and when we look at some criteria, and uh, Jenny Wells did a great study looking at inclusion criteria in some of the rehab environments, they can be very exclusive of these clients. So as soon as you have any sort of confusion, if you have, um, if you're not able to state goals, if you're not able to, um, and we're talking about, I want to walk, a, you know, a hundred meters. We, you're basically excluding this population by state, you know, developing criteria like that. Um, and I think that lastly, there's not, staff are not trained to care for this population. And I think this is a critical point. And I, and I think we forget how difficult it is. Um, and you really have to be educated and there needs to be support for, for PTs, OTs, nurses, uh, physicians to, to care for this population well. So I think that is why a lot of these individuals do not get into uh, rehab inpatient and I and we don't really have I think good services yet in community for them either. Well that kind of leads to my next question for Paula. Uh, going forward what are some recommendations for rehab of this group in a home setting? Thank you. Um, I To echo Kathy, obviously education is important but we also at least in Ontario have areas in which we don't even have enough rehab beds for individuals with hip fractures in general, let alone uh, the specific population of those with cognitive impairment. So I mentioned in the presentation that based on the study itself, there were three things that seemed to be evident about what needs to happen. It needs to start, rehab interventions need to start early in the trajectory of care, that it doesn't necessarily have to start just outpatient, but if we can continuously have this care throughout, it would be beneficial that there needs to be some type of physiotherapy component based on the physical aspect of rehab, but there also needs to be something that addresses the cognitive, but that hasn't really specifically been looked at either. As you'll notice, even in the, paper, in the studies that were presented today, they only looked at the physical outcomes, whether that was functional mobility, um, activities of daily living. They did not even include anything to do with cognitive rehab, whether that's cueing um, to remember to do things and, and whatnot. And we also said that it should be done by an interdisciplinary team in order to provide multifaceted care. Based on some conversations I had earlier this week though, the idea of whether or not people need to go to rehab right afterwards or whether they can actually be rehabbed in their home I think is a valid discussion and that needs to be had as well as going forward. Maybe there's some type of assessment that can be done and as long as we have the resources, the, the staff uh, with the proper training in place where this rehab can take place at home, perhaps that will reduce the burden on needing uh, beds specifically inpatient and th therefore those that actually need the inpatient rehab will then be able to have access to it and we also decrease the burdens on healthcare by having two different options, rehab at home and rehab inpatient. Oh, and again, the next question leads into that as well. Um, Kathy, this is for you. Where is the best place to rehabilitate persons with cognitive impairment? Yeah, I think um, this to me is a great area for future research. I don't think we really know the answer. Um, I think what we've done, again, with Toronto Rehab and uh, Nassar Mohammed and John Flannery taking a lead is we really said we don't think acute care is the place. So what we tried to suggest is a model where you're basically in acute care for up to four to five days max and then and it was called the FRAT project and then we get you out of acute care because we know you don't have the resources there to, you know, um, start rehabbing people. Having said that, we're getting them up but we're not, there's no real big program and you know what, they're pretty acute still and not made medically stable. Um, but if we can get them into an active rehab bed, that would actually be wonderful. But what we don't know is, because fam familiarity is very important for this group, how soon can we actually get them into their homes to kind of continue a rehab program? So should we be, right now, we sort of decided um, when we developed our inpatient program that, you know, loosely 25 days it sounded about right. And um, for most clients, they actually, anywhere they leave between 15 and 25 days, and some of them, of course, there are some variations. But, you know, we wonder if, if they could go home earlier, if they're medically stable and able to stand and, and obviously get around with a walker, should, could they go home a, a bit sooner? Uh, because we know once you're home, it's, it's sometimes easier, of course, I'm saying that if, as long as you can get your a walker through the, the doors, etc. So we're, there's, uh, I think, room and opportunity to kind of really figure this out um, because I think the individuals are different. And again, based on 
do you have someone at home to assist you? Is there, um, you know, do you have a husband that's able to help monitor and um, make sure you're getting the walking in? I think that's it. Plus, what's happening in, with CCAC? Are there actual supports and programs to help you uh, get going? So, I don't know if there's any one the best place, uh, but I think getting rehab is actually our goal within our sort of research program and trying to make sure it happens. And so, I think the need to then really take a good look at what rehab looks like in community is important. I think we we struggle with is it a clinic? Is it in a house? Is it in you know? church, um, I think there's opportunities to do different programs there as well for this group. Hmm. So um, this question is, I, I guess there's two that are similar. Uh, is there any look into retrospective uh, cognitive changes prior to the fracture? The cause of the fracture, um, because uh, this person is saying they have noticed as dementia increases, your gait changes. Oh, fascinating. And there is re evidence to, to support that as um, gait and mobility and cognitive changes. There's quite a correlation. Um, we've, I've not done a lot of work in that area. I, we do ask clients, uh, part of the study that we've taken um, <clears throat> that some of this work started with, we did ask them to, to reflect on their past year. Do had we noticed changes, had the, their caregiver noticed changes in their cognitive status. And so we were able to sort of say, hmm, precognitive fact, cognition, uh, sorry, prior to the fall makes a, a difference in outcomes. But as far as um, how to, it influenced, you know, predicted the falls, we, we haven't looked at that kind of data. Paula, do you know anything about this? Um, no, uh, basically what you said is what I know uh, as well. We do try to look back at the ask them retrospectively, um, but it becomes the whole what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Did the cognitive impairment lead to the fall or has now, or uh, the hip fracture, or is now the hip fracture and the stress of that scenario developed a cognitive impairment or exasperated all of the signs and symptoms for it to come forward? Mm -hmm. hmm. So why do you think there has been a paucity of studies in this field? Um, because most clinical trials look at, um, I was trying to get a homogeneous population, so often they exclude clients with a cognitive impairment and even we notice multimorbidity, so if you have many chronic illnesses and a cognitive impairment, you're, you're not going into the trials. But, and I think the other real reason is because they actually weren't even being rehabbed. So I, I think 10 years ago, uh, the notion of actually accessing a rehab bed was pretty remote. So except for geriatric rehab units, which have been really doing a beautiful job of caring for this population for many, many years, uh, which I neglected to say. But the problem is there, there's so few of those um, in Ontario. In fact, when we did our first work in 20, 2000 and um, I think it was about five or six, we did actually find about eight of those units in Ontario. So that's why we thought we better venture into more of sort of the active rehab beds. <clears throat> so I think that would be one reason why there's not a lot of research uh, in with this group is because they actually don't access rehab. Hmm. Okay, this isn't a question. This is just the group at Toronto Rehab are listening and they wanted to share that 97% of their hip fracture population return home and their average length of stay is 24 to 28 days. Beautiful. Our average admission date post-surgery is day 10, however our target is day 5. We don't have the stats for cognitive impairment, but we do take patients with mild and moderate cognitive impairment. Which is wonderful. So this is the group that we've done our first pilot project with. So they're pioneers, I see, um, in Ontario and Canada, and they're a fabulous group of healthcare practitioners. So thank you for giving me the updated stats. And I think I have one last question for you, and, and this might uh, take longer, uh, depending on what your answer is. Are you considering doing more research in this area? Paula. Yes, um, there's, that's the short answer. The long answer, I think that there's so many different aspects that we need to consider with respect to where to go next, whether or not looking at interventions that already exist for those whose cognitive reserve are intact, if, if those are appropriate enough for individuals with cognitive 
or do we need to take a more tailored, individualized approach? Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm recently curious in the direct route of home rehab or inpatient rehab to see which might be beneficial as well. For example, if we can get somebody home so they can walk from their living room to their kitchen, can the rehab at home be what's beneficial in progressing to allow them to walk around the block? And whether or not that's even important to the patient. Something I'm specifically interested in as I have a background in ergonomics is looking at the person environment fit. I've seen all too many times a family member after they've gone through surgery and inpatient rehab return home and their family members think that they are actually too lucid to stay there or can't function. Meanwhile, especially in Toronto areas, it's because their microwave is hanging underneath the, the cabinet whereas we just simply need to move that microwave now onto the, the countertop so that they can reach it effectively in that form of food. So there's sometimes some solutions that can be made that we can actually enable them to stay at home longer. And I think those are some key areas we need to focus on. So back to the short answer, yes. Yeah, and I, and I guess following up on that, I think there is some possibility of looking at um, really what does the rehab look like at at home and um, you know at the end of the day how long what's the duration and, and I'm really concerned about the caregiver so much of this falls on them to make sure the person continues to walk and there's prompting going on so we've often we thought about technology in the home as well how can that help um, and to maybe cue the person so that they can continue to be mobile and as independent as possible good so that was my last question. There's a few more, but I, I think I'll turn this over to John now. Thank you very much. So my, my thanks uh, also, uh, also for uh, Paula and Kathy for the very informative uh, uh, discuss, uh, talk and, and the discussion. And just from the number of questions, um, it very uh, lots of interest in the area. If anybody has further uh, questions, uh, please uh, let us know, and we can see about uh, getting them answered. Um, and uh, immediately after this webinar, a very brief survey will pop up on your screen. Uh, please take some time uh, to answer it. We value your feedback, and certainly we value your opinions how we can continue to improve uh, this webinar series. Also, as we go forward, if you have any suggestions as to topics for future webinars or you may be interested in presenting a webinar, please let us know. Uh, we're currently subscribed till the spring and uh, late spring of uh, 2016, uh, but uh, any time after that uh, uh, would, uh, would work. And finally, our, our next webinar. Our next webinar will be on August 19th at uh, 12, and uh, um, and that's going to also look at hip fracture, and that's look at quality indicators of uh, hip fractures at the scoping review by Susan Jaglal uh, and uh, Kristen Pitzel at uh, University Health uh, Network. Uh, please follow us on uh, Twitter, and finally. Um, the webinar slides that uh, will be available on our uh, website, they'll be available within the next couple of days. All the other webinars that have been done uh, in this series are also available there. They're a valuable resource, uh, so please uh, take advantage of, uh, of them. Um, and, um, and uh, they're freely available. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to thank our presenters again and, uh, um, and uh, thank you to everybody for taking the time out of your busy schedules for, uh, for attending today and speak to you on, uh, on August uh, 19th. Uh, goodbye then.